Michael Whitman is the most famous tank commander of the Third Reich. He was the most decorated German tank ace of the war. At Kursk, the greatest tank battle in history, he spearheads the attack. But we just accumulated kill after kill. In Normandy, Whitman single-handedly halts an Allied advance. One German tank was able to knock out so many British tanks in a matter of a few minutes. Whitman's final battle turns him into a Nazi legend. It was almost suicidal for the Germans to mount that attack. Even though it's been 60 years after Whitman's death, his legacy, his mystique, maintains. La Cam German Military Cemetery, Normandy, France. 21,000 graves, a monument to the death of the German army in Normandy and to the downfall of Adolf Hitler's reviled Third Reich. And yet amongst the rows of unadorned gravestones, there is one man's grave that is always honored with fresh flowers. His name, Michael Whitman. Whitman is considered the greatest tank ace of all time. He was the ace of aces. Many people say that he was a very quiet, likable man. He wasn't a, your typical Nazi. Most tank commanders weren't personally decorated by Hitler, but most didn't quite stand out with the number of kills that, that Whitman did. Whitman's mentality was aggressive, motivated, disciplined, kind of a, encapsulates the panzer arm of World War II into a, a, a person. Whitman died here in the fields of Normandy. But his legend began in the fields of Bavaria. Born in 1914 on a farm south of Nuremberg, Whitman was a country boy living the healthy outdoor life. At 19, Whitman is drafted into the army for compulsory service. As all young men are in the Germany of Adolf Hitler. In 1937, after completing his service, Michael Whitman, aged 23, eagerly volunteers for Hitler's personal bodyguard, the Leibstandard SS Adolf Hitler. It's an elite unit. They were in parades, they were very regimented. It would have been hand-picked personnel. Uh, they would have had certain height and physical fitness requirements, a certain look. He's not only a volunteer, but he's seemingly politically indoctrinated to want to be part of this unit. I swear to thee, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Chancellor of the German Reich, loyalty and bravery. I vow to thee, obedience unto death. Being the honor guard, I'm sure it was very appealing to somebody in their early 20s. With the you know, black uniforms and the, the smart look and the, the whole elite quality about them. Michael Whitman embraces absolute loyalty to Adolf Hitler and his policy of persecution of the Jews. And to his program of conquest and expansion of the Third Reich. But in September 1939, Hitler invades Poland, triggering the Second World War. Now for Whitman and his generation of young Nazis, the parades are over and the fighting begins. Because of his excellence as a driver, Whitman is given command of a reconnaissance vehicle. By early summer 1941, the Nazis are the masters of Europe. But for Adolf Hitler, the real prize lies to the east, the Soviet Empire, vast spaces for the master race to conquer and colonize. 
June 22, 1941, Hitler invades the Soviet Union. Codename, Operation Barbarossa. Three million German soldiers, led by 3,600 tanks, plunge into the Soviet Union. Against the Germans, the Soviets mobilize. 2.9 million men and 20,000 tanks. Despite their superior numbers, the Soviets are quickly overwhelmed by the speed and skill of the German panzers. Michael Whitman's reconnaissance unit races over the Soviet frontier with the Leibstandard, part of the leading armored force. Hitler's armored divisions were important in the fact that they were the ones that were spearheading the advances. The whole mentality of the tank force was always keep moving. Whitman and the Leibstandart are now part of the notorious Waffen-SS. The Waffen-SS had a few premier divisions, Leibstandart being one of them, that maintained its elite status throughout the war. As the panzers slash hundreds of kilometers through Russian defenses, millions of prisoners are taken. The Waffen-SS does have a reputation for committing atrocities on the Eastern Front. Over three million will be shot or starved to death. Three weeks after the invasion, the Leibstandart is closing in on the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. At the forefront is reconnaissance sergeant Michael Whitman. July 12, 1941. The Panzers advance over hilly, wooded country. As they near the city of Zhitomir, 200 kilometers southwest of Kiev, the Soviets counterattack. Dozens of Soviet T-34 tanks bear down on the Leibstandart. The T-34 has been a shock for the Germans. Weighing 26 tons, the T-34 is heavily armored with sloping sides to deflect shells. Armed with a powerful 76.2 millimeter gun, it is better than anything the Germans can feel. Whitman is ordered to reconnoiter the enemy forces in a Sturmgeschütz III or Stug. Whitman drove his Sturmgeschütz to high ground to try to locate the Soviets. He spotted two groups of Soviet T-34 tanks, six coming from northeast and another 12 from the east. That meant 18 T-34s against Wittmann's single assault gun. It was no match. Wittmann had to act quickly to even the odds. He ordered his driver to take the Sturmgeschütz off the high ground. Wittmann has been ordered not to engage the enemy tanks, as the heavier T-34s outgun his Sturmgeschütz III. Sturmgeschütz is designed initially to be infantry support. It's not designed to engage other tanks. Built on the chassis of a Panzer III, the Stug is a turretless assault gun, which means the driver has to swing the whole vehicle around to aim its high-velocity 75-millimeter cannon. The Sturmgeschütz has a movable uh, cannon of 24 degrees only. You have to face the enemy straight forward, not from the side. If you see the enemy, you have to turn. Despite being outnumbered and outmatched by the Russian tanks, Whitman disobeys his orders and attacks the T-34s. His personality that was mated to the Panzer credo of attack that uh, that would have been the first thing he was looking for, was an opportunity to be preempted. As the T-34 surged forward towards the crest of the hill, Wittmann's only hope was to set up an ambush. It was a direct hit. A second T-34 surged over the hill. It went up in flames. 
A third T-34 managed to get a shot at Wittmann's Sturmgeschütz. The T-34s were not as accurate, we thought at least, than ours. More Russian tanks poured forward. There were just too many. Wittmann headed for cover. He used the assault gun's low profile to hide it in a small wood. I liked the Sturmgeschütz because uh, of the low silhouette. And that gave me a, 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 a feeling of being safer. But facing so many T-34s, there was nowhere for him to hide. Wittmann's driver swiveled the stool to bring its gun to bear on the Russian. Firing would have, would have definitely been an issue because of the inability to track a target via a turret. You would have to maneuver the vehicle. And again, his gunner scored a direct hit. With the T-34, the only weak part is uh, between uh, the, the turret and uh, the body to get right into the crack. Another T-34 tried to target the thin side armor on the Sturmgeschütz. Wittmann had to turn quickly and fire before the Russian got in a shot. You hit the tracks if you can. When the tracks uh, burst, of course, he just goes around in a circle. With his fast maneuvering, Wittmann began to even the odds. Then three more enemy tanks attacked. Wittmann opened fire. Only one of the Soviet tanks escaped. Six of the formidable T-34s destroyed in just a few minutes. Whitman and his crew stopped the Soviet armored attack. For his actions, Whitman is awarded the Iron Cross second class. Impressed by his exploits, Whitman's commanders send him back to Germany to train to become an officer of the SS. Whitman's career is on the rise. Autumn 1942, Bad Tulse, Germany. Michael Whitman begins his training in Heinrich Himmler's Waffen SS school. Its aim is to form a new SS military elite the future leaders of Hitler's Nazi empire. Whitman graduates as an SS second lieutenant and is soon training on Germany's newest tank, the Tiger. Hitler's answer to the Soviet T-34, it is the most formidable tank in the world. At 100 millimeters, the Tiger's frontal armor is virtually impregnable. Its 88 millimeter gun can cut through a T-34 at over two kilometers. Wir waren ein Tiger, Leute. Wir waren stolz, hatten das beste Gerät, was wir hatten. Und zwar auch ein guter Panzer. Und wir waren zum ersten Mal den russischen Panzern haushoch überlegen. In February 1943, Whitman is called back to the Russian front as part of the Leibstandard's new Tiger Company. But by the summer, the tide of battle is turning against Germany. Soviet forces surge west, creating a huge bulge protruding into the German lines near the Russian city of Kursk. Desperate to regain the initiative, Adolf Hitler plans a counteroffensive, Operation Citadel. It will be a two-pronged attack from north and south to chop off the bulge leaving half a million Soviet soldiers cut off and trapped. For the Citadel Offensive, the Germans have amassed 780,000 men and 2,500 tanks. To meet the Germans, the Soviets field almost 2 million men and more than 5,000 tanks. The Leibstandart will be at the front of the southern attack. With them at the spearhead will be Michael Whitman, now commanding a platoon of five Tiger tanks. On the eve of battle, Whitman's commander reads out Adolf Hitler's message to the crews. Soldiers, today 
you set out on a great offensive, whose result can decisively affect the outcome of the war. My soldiers, now, finally, you have better tanks than the enemy. The German homeland looks to you with ardent confidence. We just thought we were superior to the, to the Russian tanks. At least we were brainwashed to believe that, which helps to make you feel superior, you know. You know what propaganda does. <laughs> July 5th, 1943. At dawn, the Tiger crews wait for their attack to begin. The order came over the tank radios. Panzers, forward! As we advanced, we were met by a relentless storm of fire. The Russians had prepared line after line of defenses, which dug in T-34s. Because the T-34 was inferior to the Tiger I, it needed to compensate for its deficiencies. One of the ways was to have pre-dug positions for the vehicles. The incoming round would have to penetrate several feet of dirt to be able to actually get to the vehicle itself. The Tiger's powerful 88 millimeter gun is able to break through the Russian defenses. while the Russian shells bounce off the Tiger's armor. Overcoming line after line of Russian defense, Wittmann and the Tigers push towards the objective. But the Russians continue to throw wave after wave of tanks at our advance. These were all fresh targets for Wittmann's gunner. Wittmann's tank kept moving, firing as it turned, smashing one T-34 after another. Knocking out eight tanks and 12 anti-tank guns, this first day of battle has been a success for Wittmann and his elite crew. We call it Zusammen gespielt, you know, played together, you know, so that one interacts with the other the right way. The loader, the gunner, the commander, the driver, the radio man. It's a tightly knit group. July 12, 1943. The Germans set off to assault the final Soviet defense line before Kursk. Whitman's commander is wounded, and Whitman must take over command of the Leibstandarts Tiger Company, just as the Battle of Kursk is about to reach its climax. Unknown to the Germans, the Russians are preparing a desperate last-ditch counterattack. The Germans were on the verge of breaking through into open country, and the Soviets were starting to panic. They were going to throw whatever they had available into the mix. The Russians send 500 tanks west to attack the German right flank, but the Waffen-SS tanks turn east. These huge tank forces are about to collide near the little town of Prokhorovka. Second Lieutenant Whitman and his crew are ordered to high ground. In the distance, what seemed like a dust cloud was rising. Suddenly, hundreds of Soviet tanks appeared at the crest of a hill, headed straight towards Wittmann. We were in shock. The Soviets were not on the defensive, they were attacking. Just 1,600 meters from Wittmann, more than 100 Soviet tanks are charging towards him, over the gently rolling land of the steppe. We had a number of hills, but it was predominantly open terrain, so the Tiger tank could engage at long distance. With a well-aimed shot, a Tiger can knock out a T-34 at a distance of two kilometers. But the Russian tanks have to get much closer before their guns can have any effect on the Tigers. We have in Angriff, we have to do so for the Panzer and Panzer, the große Kette, and on the other side, the T-34 is raced towards us, trying to close the deadly gap. 
Nazi came back into view, now only 800 meters away. The Tigers opened fire. A lot of tanks in a relatively small area. Something of a shooting gallery from a Tiger I commander's perspective. The T-34s were still not close enough to penetrate the armor of the Tigers, so they had to keep advancing straight through our barrage. They got to 700 meters. Getting closer. And closer. The Tiger guns were belching fire, but there were too many. They couldn't all be stopped. The Russians slam into the SS formation. At close range, the German tanks are vulnerable. Whitman's Tigers spring into action. Whitman's gunner fires on the move, again and again. One of the reasons that Whitman was so successful as a Tiger commander was his ability to fire while moving on the, with the vehicle. And that way they could acquire the target, but they, they'd get rounds on the target more quickly. Such a technique wasn't normal. In fact, German regulations stressed that the tanks should not fire when on the move. It's basically a waste of ammunition. But Whitman and his crew have mastered the difficult technique, using it to their advantage. From Whitman's perspective, Prokhorovka would have just been chaos. They would have had firing at close range. Whitman's tank is hit twice, but keeps on fighting. The missiles of both sides, Panzer of Panzer. The battle rages for hours. The Russians take appalling losses. But they succeed in slowing the German advance. Kursk is considered one of the greatest tank battles in history because of the numbers of tanks and other armored vehicles involved in a relatively small area. Our Tiger Company had a series of fine successes. Over the whole Citadel Kursk battle, we destroyed 151 enemy tanks. Despite the success of the Tiger units, the ferocious Russian defenses has stopped Hitler's offensive. The Germans have lost the decisive tank battle on the Eastern Front. From now on, Michael Whitman will be fighting for his and for Nazi Germany's survival. In its third winter on the Eastern Front, the German army is in full retreat. The Russians have pushed them 500 kilometers from Kursk back into the Ukraine. Michael Whitman's Tiger unit is fighting a series of desperate rear guard actions. Tiger units would have been sent from one sector of the front to the other to try and plug gaps that had been opened up by Soviet armored forces and uh, attempted to uh, blunt them so that way German forces can continue their retreat to the west. The rapid Russian advance leaves the Soviet supply lines stretched dangerously thin, making supply convoys a vital necessity. December 6, 1943. Whitman and his unit, now designated the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion, are poised to attack a Soviet supply convoy near the town of Brusilov. 
But between the convoy and the Tigers are batteries of Russian anti-tank guns. The Soviet 76.2 millimeter divisional gun is a tank killer. It can smash through a Tiger's side armor at a distance of nearly 1,000 meters and wreck its tracks. To kill these anti-tank batteries, Whitman's tactic is to play a dangerous game, using himself and his tank as bait. Whitman drove to high ground. He was tempting the Russian gunners to fire at him. They took the bait, but now the gunners had revealed their positions. Under heavy fire, Whitman quickly retreated. Then our Tigers raced at the anti-tank guns from their blind spots, charging straight at them before the Russians could turn the guns around. Whitman's tactic has worked. The anti-tank batteries are now a smoking wreck. But his tiger reveals just how dangerous Whitman's game can be. We counted a total of 28 hits on the tiger. Some of them were smaller, of course, but there were also some big enough to easily put one's fist into. With the anti-tank batteries eliminated, Whitman races towards the supply road. He drives into cover to observe the road, and he spots a convoy. Though he's heavily outnumbered, Whitman decides to attack on his own. Whitman would have been trying to make the best of a bad situation. He would have been increasingly reckless due to necessity in engaging enemy targets. Like a wolf attacking its prey, he quickly knocks out the lead tank. And the rear tank leaving the convoy trapped on the road at his mercy. Wittmann blasted the enemy with furious barrages of gunfire. He placed his fiery mark on the road, smashing long lines of Soviet vehicles into junk. This caused mass confusion amongst the Soviets. Whitman's daring lone wolf attack has worked brilliantly. The Russian convoy has been destroyed. Over the next few weeks, he goes on a rampage, knocking out 61 enemy tanks. His total kills soon reach 117. He paints the number of kills on his tank barrel. On January 16, 1944, Whitman is awarded the Knight's Cross, Nazi Germany's second highest military honor. Then, just a few weeks later, his Knight's Cross is upgraded with oak leaves, and he is promoted to first lieutenant. On February 2nd, 1944, Whitman is called to the Führer's Eastern Front headquarters to receive his new commendation from Adolf Hitler himself. I think one of the reasons that Whitman was decorated to the degree that he was, was that he was part of the Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler division. And that's Hitler's name in the unit. Whitman is now ordered back to Germany, where his exploits have already made him famous. But the country he finds upon his return is in ruins, a result of Allied bombing. The sight of such senseless destruction of our cities is enough to make one's heart bleed. The Anglo-Americans have taught us to hate. They will see this hate transformed into energy. We desire one thing, to get them in front of our guns. 
we have only one watchword, and that is revenge. The war effort was definitely going against Germany, and they were looking for ways to keep up the public morale. He visited the Henschel factory where the Tiger One was made and made a speech to the workers there. I think Whitman was used as propaganda for the Nazi party, but I don't think it was totally unwilling on his part. I think it was just another way of contributing to the war effort. The Reich made him a celebrity intentionally. During his triumphal tour of Germany, Whitman marries 19-year-old Hildegard Burmester. The couple is offered a special wedding gift, Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, Hitler went to Whitman's wedding. Uh, a tank case in Germany was so important. Before he can arrange a honeymoon for his young bride, Whitman receives a new posting. So his wife accompanies him with his Tiger Battalion to the Chateau Elbeuf in Normandy, France. Michael Whitman will soon have his chance at revenge on Germany's enemies. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces land in Normandy. Hitler orders his panzer forces to drive the Allies back into the sea. For Michael Whitman and his Tigers, the Allied beachhead is over 200 kilometers away. Whitman started off on June 6th with 45 Tiger tanks, which is a full complement for that 101st Heavy SS Tank Battalion. But it takes Whitman five harrowing days to get his second company to the Normandy battlefield, under unrelenting attacks by Allied fighter bombers that decimate his forces. A week later, it was down to about six vehicles that were serviceable. Whitman and the 101st SS Heavy Panzer Battalion are positioned on the left and most crucial sector of the front, facing the British and the Canadians. The Germans would have concentrated their armored units around the British and Canadian sector because if that sector had fallen, that would have been the shortest route to Germany. So they had to hold that with their stronger units. The Allies are preparing the break out of the beachhead. Their plan is to send the British 7th Armored Division towards the key city of Caen, through the town of villers bocage June 13th, 1944. Sheltering from Allied bombers, Whitman positions his surviving Tigers under the cover of trees near villers bocage The British 22nd Armored Brigade was moving through the town. The column of British tanks is just 200 meters from Whitman's position. The British do not know Whitman is there, but they are about to find out. Then a man came into the command post and said, Obersturmführer, tanks are driving past. I don't think they're German. I had no idea that the enemy might suddenly appear. Whitman saw that there was an opportunity and that the British armored vehicles were in a nice, neat line approaching his position. I went outside and saw English and American tanks rolling past about 150 to 200 meters distance. Never had I been so impressed by the strength of the enemy as I was by those tanks rolling by. Whitman is facing 138 tanks and armored vehicles, while he has only six tanks. The decision to attack was a very difficult one, but I knew it absolutely had to be, and I decided to strike out at the enemy. Whitman's split-second decision will become legendary. I had no time to assemble my company. I set off with one tank. I drove up to the column, surprised the English as much as they had surprised me. I first knocked out two tanks from the right of the column, then one from the left. With them being in such close proximity to each other, there was no room to maneuver. I then turned about to the left 
and attack the armored troop carriers in the middle of the armored regiment. They never left the road. They were so surprised that they took to flight, but not with their vehicles. Instead, they jumped out and I shot up the battalion's vehicles as I drove by. I drove towards the rear of the column on the same road, knocking out every tank that came toward me. The enemy was thrown into total confusion. I was able to take out tanks as well as armored troop carriers. Then I drove straight into the town of villers bocage The town has already been occupied by British armor. Whitman continues his single-handed attack. Claiming a total of 21 Allied tanks destroyed. I got to approximately the center of town, where I was hit by an anti-tank gun. My tank was disabled. I fired at and destroyed everything around me that I could reach. I then abandoned the tank. Whitman's deadly rampage has lasted barely 15 minutes, but he has devastated an entire enemy regiment. By single-handedly knocking out the British column, it kept the Allies from taking the area around Khan for two months, and it added to the mystique of Whitman's abilities as a panzer commander. German newsreels make the most of the Allied setback at villers bocage in den engen Straßen wurde eine stärkere amerikanische Panzereinheit gestellt und zusammengeschossen. Whitman is the most famous tank officer in the German army. But the following day, the stress of battle shows on his face. Whitman is celebrated for his astounding feat by 1st SS Panzer Corps Commander Sepp Dietrich who recommends him for yet another commendation. In July, Whitman is once again personally decorated by Hitler, this time adding two swords to his knight's cross with oak leaves. But Whitman was the most decorated tank commander, uh, not only for his experience on the battlefield, but I would think also for the propaganda value that could be showcased through him. And so Michael Whitman reaches the height of his fame in Normandy. And it is in Normandy that his fate and his myth will be sealed. August 8th, 1944, two months after villers bocage Michael Whitman is now a captain and acting commander of his battalion. Yet as Whitman's career soars, Hitler's army in Normandy is headed towards destruction. Now the Allies launch a decisive punch, codenamed Operation Totalize. British and Canadian armor storms along the Cannes Falaise Road, smashing 14 kilometers through the German lines towards the village of Sinto. As 300 Allied tanks bear down on Sinto, the 12th SS Panzer Division is ordered to bar their advance. With the remnants of the heavily outnumbered division is Captain Michael Whitman, with a small group of Tiger tanks. The division's leader, Colonel Kurt Mayer, now orders an immediate counterattack. Whitman's Tigers were standing ready behind a hedge east of Sinto. We had to risk the attack in order to win time. It was uh, almost suicidal for the Germans to mount that attack, but this was their system. 
If they were hit, they would hit back immediately. Whitman is in reserve, but he insists on leading the attack. Michael said to me, I must be in the attack myself, for the other officers can barely cope. Kurt Mayer knows the situation is hopeless. I shook Michael Whitman's hand. Michael laughed his youthful laugh and climbed into his tiger. And so Michael Whitman sets off on the attack. Just eight German tanks advancing against 300 Allied tanks. I don't think Whitman is exactly a fatalist. I don't think that he just figured that he was going to die. Maybe this was the best place to do it. Whitman and probably his crew didn't think so much about their own personal safety as the overall war effort. What Whitman doesn't know is there is a hidden danger waiting for him on either side of the Khan Falaise Road. British tanks of the Northamptonshire Yeomanry are lying in wait in the woods to his right. Canadian tanks of the Sherbrooke Fusiliers are hidden behind a wall to his left. We drove off, Michael right of the road and I left of the road. Approximately 800 meters to Michael's right, there was a small wood, which looked suspicious. The British tanks hidden in the woods observe Whitman. There were four, certainly four tigers, which came down on what would have been our side of the main road. The Canadians of the Sherbrookes were, as far as I can see, actually much nearer, but they were on the other side of the main road. The Canadian tanks are hidden from Whitman's view behind a long chateau wall. We sneaked up right beside a brick wall and got in reasonable cover. Just hit the wall just enough that you could get your gun, that you could move it sufficiently. I could see on the right, the first German tanks came out from Sintho. Right away, I can remember the wireless net becoming active. I can see them, I can see them. I saw this dog has come in, across in front of us, about 1,200 yards away. Our tank commander, they said, we'll wait till they get to about 800 yards. We drove about one to one and a half kilometers. I was now starting to get a bit itchy. The Allies not only have the element of surprise, they have a new tank, the Sherman Firefly. The Firefly, upgunned with a powerful 17-pounder cannon, is able to penetrate 130 millimeters of steel. Enough for even the thickest armor on a tiger. For the first time, we realized that uh, we now had a tank which was equal to the tiger. Whitman's tigers are now in the kill zone. With my eyes, I could see the tank closest to the road, about two, 200 yards, I guess. The tank commander said, advanced driver, and we pull out of cover. As we pull out of cover, he says, um, target the rear target. I fired. We began taking heavy fire, and then I received a radio message from Michael. Achtung, Achtung, von rechts. I'd look around at the second tank. one shot at the second tank. The loader reloads. Again, fire when ready. Three of the four Tigers are now knocked out. Whitman's tank moves on alone. From close range, the Canadians now open fire at Whitman's tank. The one that he was in, I think, went by me. Other people from my squad were firing at it now. 
Whitman's tiger is hit. When I got to within 300 meters of Michael's tiger, flames suddenly shot from the tank. I can remember a tremendous explosion and seeing the turret hit the ground. August 8th, 1944. Michael Whitman has fought his final battle. Whether his last thoughts as he went down the road were simply Valhalla, here I come, a sort of a death wish. He must have known there was no way they were going to win. August 25th, just days after Whitman's death, the German army in Normandy is defeated. Many of Hitler's soldiers remain in Normandy, buried in La Camme German military cemetery. Somber gravestones recall the unheralded end of the Nazi empire. Yet Michael Whitman is still celebrated. I, I think there's a myth to Michael Whitman's combat experiences. People look at him as, yes, being a Nazi, but it's not the reason that they admire his abilities in combat. I think if you're on the receiving end of that, you're gonna have a different perspective. He uh, accepted the doctrines of uh, Hitler enough to get in his tank and, and invade other people's countries, country after country, to kill men, women, and, ch and children. He might have been a hero to the Germans, but uh, not to me. Even though it's been 60 years after Whitman's death, his legacy, his mystique, maintains to today. I swear to thee, Adolf Hitler, as Führer and Chancellor of the German Reich, obedience unto death. <laughs>